thanking um, the YES seminar series for inviting me to be a part of this. It's really an honor for me. Um, I don't come to Korea as often as I used to. Uh, I was saying to some of your colleagues when I was a graduate student, I lived in uh, the Shilindong area near SNU, uh, which I, I now learned was not a really representative um, space in Korea because it was like the most stressed out um, place in all of Seoul that I possibly could find. It was very good for work, uh, but it probably wasn't the most fun area. And I was a graduate student at that time in 1998. Since then, I've had the great opportunity of coming back to uh, Korea many times uh, to work on my first book on healthy democracies and uh, a more recent book on biotech innovation and science and technology development. And I find myself back here again uh, with a great opportunity to share with all of you a new book um, that I'm working on right now. It's a book that I'm writing with Professor Dan Slater from the University of Chicago. Um, and we're working on, we're writing it right now for uh, Princeton University Press. And it's on the issue of democratization. So I have, to, I have to stress to you, some of you may have seen the talk again yesterday, the work that I'm doing now in terms of my own research is on poverty and Quality. But for me, democracy and democratization is a, is a topic that's extremely dear to me. And it's extremely dear to me because uh, I have many friends who have fought for democracy. I have many friends in dictatorships today that would like to see democracy. And I appreciate just how difficult it is to actually create democracies. And so when I'm in places like Korea or Taiwan uh, or Indonesia, um, I have a real deep appreciation for the types of battles that they had. So recently, um, our editor from Princeton came to see us and we talked about how we want to frame the book, right? And how we want to write the book in a way that would be interesting um, for the reader. And so what we want to do is we want to write a book about the Asia region. It's not a book about the whole world, and it's not a book about one country but rather it's a book about the Asia region, and we want to treat the Asia region as a lab, right? as a lab through which we can really explore an age-old question of democracy and development. And so for those of you who are in political science or study political economy, will know that there are a whole host of theories out there, theories about why countries democratize and indeed why countries don't. So we also want to treat it as a region because we have a real deep sense, we have a worry in many ways that people think of Asia, the region, as China's Asia. There's no doubt that the 21st century is in many ways China's century. There's no doubt that China's reach in terms of its power and in terms of its political reach is expanding all the time. And so therefore, it leads many people to conclude that this may be, in fact, the era of China's supremacy. The idea that, for instance, the Beijing consensus is something that is worthwhile emulating. The idea that authoritarianism is good for economic development. And that economic development trumps things like human rights. This worries us. And what we actually want to argue is the opposite. But we want to argue that it's not a China that is shaping Asia, but rather it's an Asia that is shaping China. And more specifically, we want to argue that it's a democratic Asia that is potentially shaping China. And we want to stress that not only is it a democratic Asia, but it's a democratic Asia with a long history. That democratic Asia and the democracies inside Asia Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Indonesia, and so on, that these democracies are not just simply accidental democracy, that they're not just simply incidental moments along the history of post-war development in Asia. In other words, what we want to offer is a coherent logic of democratic transformation, and a coherent logic of democratic transformation that even a China cannot escape, that this democratic logic is something that China will so that's essentially how we finished the book. But let me begin then by sort of setting up the argument. So the book actually begins with the chapter on Japan. Now the conventional wisdom about Japan 
Japan to democracy is that it was essentially given to Japan by the Americans. I can't tell you how many times when I'm in China and I'm teaching in China or I'm interacting with young people in China and we talk about political reform, they say, well, you know, the only reason why Japan is a democracy is because the United States gave it its democracy. And that's the conventional wisdom that an American occupation necessarily leads to democracy. Now, of course, here in South Korea, you know that's not at all the case. That, in fact, you can have an American occupation, you can have a very strong American presence, but if you were to cut into South Korean history, say 1959 to 1961, you can see that that's not necessarily the case. We want to make the same argument about Japan. It's easy to say today that, well, democracy in Japan was a foregone conclusion and America gave Japan its democracy, but let's just rewind a little bit and say you walked into Japan in 1947. 1947 in Japan, and you were just asked yourself, is this place going to stay a democracy? It was a 50-50 proposition. Right? We had weak political parties. We had a series of coalition governments that would be elected and would immediately fall. We had massive levels of corruption. We had uh, an economy that was still very slowly growing. And most importantly, those conservatives, right, those same people that had allowed for and facilitated the rise of a fascist militaristic Japan were still around. And they were still around in this post-war moment. So, in other words, you walk into Japan in 1947 and you might say to yourself, this democracy is on a pretty shaky foundation. So the idea that American imposition of democracy equals democratic development is highly problematic. So the point that we want to make is, is that democracy is not a foregone. What motivates our book, therefore, then, is what we would call democratic possibility. So I've given you a little bit of a story about Japan. Let me shift gears and talk a little bit about Indonesia. Let me just give you another sense of what we mean by democratic possibility. In May of 1998, you may recall, the Suharto regime is overthrown. Right? The Suharto regime was an autocratic regime. By every measure, this looks like the end of Golkar. Golkar was the ruling party. Right? So uh, Suharto falls. It looks like the end of Golkar. And to make matters worse, the president who steps in is Habibi. And if you were to go back in time to 1998, Habibi was a very weak president. He was not particularly popular. He did not have a particularly strong hold over the Golkar ruling party. In other words, we had a regime that was hanging on by a thread. It was under assault. It was severely weakened. Now, the conventional wisdom, political science theory would tell us that under those conditions, amidst crisis and a weak president, political science theory should tell us that we would expect the regime to repress. And there's good reason. So Barbara Geddes, who was one of the most influential political scientists, writes very simply, and this is a very powerful statement, the preferences of party cadres are much simpler than those of military officers. Like democratic politicians, they simply want to hold on to office. So Geddes' argument basically is that military dictators can always return to the barracks. They have somewhere to go. But if you're a civilian dictator, you have no other choice. You're going to hang on until the very end. And the way in which you hang on is through repression. So everyone in 1998 expected Habibi to repress. Everyone in 1998 expected Golkar to hang on and repress to the very end. But actually what happens is something totally unexpected. Elections were supposed to be held in 2002, and what Habibi does is he actually expedites the elections to 1999. Now, for most of us who were watching Indonesia at that point, this was very counterintuitive. You're a regime hanging on by a thread. Why would you expedite the elections? Because in effect, you're expediting your own defeat. Our argument actually is quite the opposite. What we want to argue is that Khabibi himself was weak. He was absolutely 
but the party, Golkar, was still relatively strong. In other words, Habibi expedites the elections and ushers in democratic reform when the party still has a chance to survive. After all, if you think about it, in Indonesia, it was the Golkar party that presided over a developmental state. It was a Golkar party that had essentially turned Indonesia from an economic basket case into a rising industrial nation. It was the Golkar party that had tremendous territorial advantage. In other words, it had popularity across the country. And it was the Golkar party that had power in the peripheral areas of the country. So by moving the elections to 1999 instead of 2002, plus if you think about it, the best option for Habibi and indeed Golkar to survive. And it was the best option because even though Habibi himself was weak, the party was still strong. And indeed, what ends up happening is Golkar came in second place. In 1999, it was not wiped out. It was still strong enough to come in second place. And in 2004, Golkar becomes the ruling party again. I tell you this story because theory, and Getty's theory is an extremely powerful influential theory, theory would have predicted authoritarian repression. But what we argue instead is democratic possibilities. In that moment of crisis, when the party is still strong, Gettys would have said they would have continued repression. We actually find that, in fact, we see democratic possibility. We have this faith in democratic possibility because, after all, we want to argue that democratic possibilities are a function of choice. So things like economic development, urbanization, industrialization, all of the characteristics of modernization theory, they facilitate that choice towards democracy. But we want to stress that they are not determinative. After all, and this is one of the problems with modernization theory, it's not as though you go to bed one night in a dictatorship and then you wake up the next morning and you were modern and you were totally democracy. Overnight, somebody had to make that choice. Indeed, that choice, and we want to argue, choosing democracy is not easy. That's why we don't see it very often. From the point of view of those who are fighting for democracy, maybe your parents, maybe some of your, certainly my colleagues who are in the professorial ranks, they fought for democracy. Right? They were in the streets, they shed blood, sweat, and tears for democracy. So from the point of view, if you look at your colleagues in the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, Right? You can see that from the point of view of those fighting for democracy, it's not an easy choice. Right? It's a very costly choice. From the point of view of elites, choosing democracy is even more problematic because by choosing democracy, you're effectively ushering in the inconvenience of the possibility of your losing. Right? I mean, think about it for a moment. If you choose to transform an authoritarian regime into a democracy, you are effectively choosing to entertain the possibility that you might lose. And according to Gettys, that's not a choice you would make. So the question that then sort of motivates our book is why do authoritarian regimes choose democracy instead of repress? As Gettys would argue. But more specifically, why do some still strong authoritarian regimes choose democracy when they don't have to? Why do they, have, why do they choose democracy when they could still choose the option of repression and continue to survive? In other words, why would you conceive democracy, that is to say the possibility of losing, maybe even retribution, why would you choose to conceive democracy when there is no immediate need to do so? And we offer this as a research question because it's extremely puzzling. It's in many ways counterintuitive. And it's counterintuitive, or it seems counterintuitive, because it is counterintuitive. Right? Getty's argument is the logical one. Getty's argument is that you only conceive democracy from a position of extreme weakness when you have no other choice, when repression has run its course. So it is counterintuitive 
for an authoritarian regime to concede democracy from a position of relative strength. And indeed, if you look around, it is counterintuitive. When you think of the Arab Spring, you think about a regime that's hanging on from a position of pressure. When you think about the various color revolutions, whatever they may be, yellow, red, saffron, etc., you see regimes that are essentially hanging on by a thread. In other words, when you look around, it does seem like dictatorships only concede democracy when they are weak, when they have no other choice. China, I want to stress to you, is no different. And this is one of the challenges with respect to democratic transition in China. So if you look, for instance, here, this article, or this quote from the New York Times, this is about Hong Kong. Beijing is deeply averse to concessions that could diffuse the protests, in other words, political reform, out of fear that the least sign of compromise would embolden other challenges across China. Right? To concede democracy would be to concede weakness. And according to Gettys, you don't concede democracy until you are weak. And the prevailing conventional wisdom, and people like Martin Jacques and people like that write this all the time, the Chinese Communist Party is so powerful, is so strong, is so popular, it doesn't need to concede. So the implication here is therefore that if China or the CCP were to make a concession, it would be a reflection of weakness. To make, to make a concession to democracy is to concede weakness. Hence, the conventional wisdom in the China field is that China's democratic possibility will only come when the Chinese Communist Party is weak, just as Gettys would predict. Democracy in China will only come amidst crisis and imminent collapse. So everyone around, when you think about it, that's how we think about democracy in China. So those who are defenders of the Beijing regime, like Martin Schack and all, will argue there's no need to democratize because the party is still strong. And those who are critics of the Beijing regime say, we should expect democracy because the party is not strong. Either way, whether you're a critic or defender of the CCP, either way, your argument hinges on crisis and collapse. You're waiting for crisis and collapse. What Dan and I argue, though, is that this actually isn't the only path to democratization because it's not the only choice available. Now, people like Martin Jack will tell you the CCP has no need to choose democracy. We agree. We agree with Martin Jack. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't have to concede democracy today, as Gettys would predict. But we also want to argue, contrary to people like Jack, is that there is more than one choice. And the choice is basically this. Authoritarian parties can choose to concede democracy in non-crisis situations. In other words, and authoritarian parties can choose to concede democracies when the regime is still relatively powerful. It can choose to concede democracy from a position of strength, from a position of confidence. In other words, it's not impossible, let's say, it's possible that an authoritarian regime will concede democracy not to lose but will indeed concede democracy to survive and indeed to thrive. So when you think about that logic, then when we go back to Habibi's concession by moving the elections to 1999, he's not committing political suicide. He's not hanging on to the last thread. He's not conceding because he has no other choice. Indeed, what we see is that he's taking a gamble for sure. But given that the Volkar party is still relatively powerful, He's confident enough that by conceding democracy, he will not become obsolete. That the party can continue to thrive. And indeed, his gamble pays off. One could make a very similar argument, for instance, to what happens here in Korea. So when Note Table makes his announcements in the summer of 1987, right? I mean, if you think about this, you have the Pongju Massacre in 1980. You have the rise of opposition mobilization throughout the 1980s. You have the rise of anti-Americanism, as essentially democratic activists here are saying, the Americans have left us out to dry. You see, for instance, um, the rise of an opposition in elections in 1985 and so on. Right? You see the rise of an opposition. And Note Wu decides in June of 1987 
to concede democracy. So from his point of view, why would he do that? One argument, and the argument we make, is that the, the opposition remains relatively weak. The opposition, as no might have predicted, would split. And indeed, Kim Jong Sen and Kim Dae Jung do split the opposition vote such that Van Dong will wins the presidency with only 34% of the popular vote. There was a gamble, for instance, that the middle class would be the swing voter and would go back to the ruling party. And indeed, many elements of the middle class do swing back and vote for the ruling party. And there was, in many senses, a gamble that the Ming Zhou movement would fall apart shortly after the democratic transition, and if one believes the work of the historian Nami Li, then indeed it does. So there was a gamble here, but essentially what we see is No Te Wu choosing democracy, choosing to concede democracy as a gamble, but when the party is still relatively strong. So despite conventional wisdom, which is to say that you only concede during crisis, we actually see the opposite we actually see that you might concede democracy from a position of relative strength. In other words, then, democratizing from strength is about confidence. Right? It's about confidence from the point of view of the regime. And the best case, and the most emblematic case in our book, is the case of Taiwan. It really is the best case. So if one looks at, for instance, the Kuomintang in Taiwan, the KMT, this was by every measure a brutal regime. Right? This was a regime into the early to mid-1980s that was still ordering the assassination of opponents as far away as California. Right? This was not a shrinking violence. This was not a humanizing regime. This was by every measure a brutal regime. In 1986, democratic opposition, opposition democratic activists announced at the Grand Hotel in the fall of 1986 the formation of an opposition political party, the Democratic Progressive Party, or the DPP. Everybody who was a Taiwan watcher or a Chinese politics watcher predicted, as Gettys would predict, that the regime would clamp down, that the regime would destroy the party, because after all, Taiwan was still under martial law. But what actually happens is something that we didn't expect, or at least our theories would not predict. Then President Zheng Jingguo actually allows the DPP to form and doesn't crush it. And to add to that, in 1987, the Zheng Jingguo regime and the KMT regime lifts martial law. In other words, what we see is a monumental concession. The CCK himself says in 1986, the times are changing, the environment is changing, the tide is also changing. So this was a regime that, as late as 1983, was ordering assassinations of opposition activists in California. By 1986, you have the president saying, the time has changed. The tide is changing. And what we see is the KMT conceding democratic reform by allowing the DPP to form and the lifting of martial law and the introduction of full-scale elections in 1992. We see the KMT conceding when it doesn't have to. In 1986, the KMT is still extremely powerful. It still had all the instruments of state expression. It was still very popular. After all, this was an economy that was growing at 8 to 10% a year, relatively egalitarian distribution of income. This was the period in which you were now seeing the development of a high-tech sector and so on. All of the predictors of collapse don't happen. There is no crisis. But what we see is the KMT conceding when it doesn't have to. It could have hung on as an authoritarian regime, but Zheng Jingguo makes a gamble. His gamble is to concede democracy. And as we know, given that the KMT has never lost a majority in the legislative yuan, it was a gamble that has paid off enormously. In other words, the CCK does not concede to lose. Conceding democracy is not tantamount to conceding defeat. He concedes democracy because he was confident that the KMT could win. And I don't want to be historical revisionist here. Jiang Jingguo was no Democrat. He was not a nice person. He didn't go to bed you know, in the summer of 1986, wake up in the fall of 1986, and suddenly is an enlightened liberal Democrat. He was a shrewd, calculating, rational, strategic actor who basically says, if we want to survive over the long term, we need to make this concession. And we can make this concession now because we're still strong enough and we have the confidence that we can
In other words, that the KMT, the KMT concedes democracy not in crisis, but concedes democracy when it has tremendous confidence in both stability and in need that it could be victorious. It was confident that even if it were to concede democracy, the country or Taiwan, the island, would not fall apart politically. In fact, it was so confident that if it were to concede democracy, it would win. And there are many reasons why the KMT was confident. After all, the KMT had presided over a developmental state that had seen Taiwan emerge from an economic basket case in the post-war period into, at that point, one of the richest economies in East Asia. Right. In terms of per capita income, of course, as we know, if Taiwan were in fact a country and were allowed in the OECD, it would have been an OECD country likely to force South Korea. It was that rich. We had not only seen the KMT preside over phenomenal economic growth, but also equitable economic growth. The distribution of income in Taiwan was one of the most egalitarian in the world, on par with the Nordic countries. So it was growing at 10% a year, but it had a Gini coefficient of about 0.3. So you have rapid and equitable economic growth. The KMT was also confident because it had extraordinary party organization. This was a party that was disciplined. This was a party that had tentacles throughout the island. This was a party that was a proven electoral machine. This was also an authoritarian party that had transformed itself over time. The KMT by 1986 was not the same KMT of 1947. Beginning in the 1970s, uh, for instance, the KMT decides to Taiwanize the party, to bring Taiwanese into the party, right? to recast the party as not simply an emigre mainlander regime, but actually an indigenous Taiwanese regime. So it had begun to transform itself, lending itself to the kind of confidence that would lead to stability and victory. And the KMT also conceded democracy with a very unique electoral system single non-transferable vote, multi-member system learned from the Japanese, and this was, without going into details, the MMD system, or multi-member district system, gave the KMT an electoral advantage. Right? So it was pretty confident. It was going to allow the DPP to form, it was going to lift martial law, but there was no way the KMT was going to In short, then, the KMT concedes democracy not to lose, but to win. And again, we want to stress that Getty's theory doesn't account for this kind of uh, decision. Um, right. So our theory basically then, or actually I should show you the slide. The camp, this is a, based on our article. The camp ultimately chose to concede democracy because the party was in a position not of desperation, but of fairly strong confidence that democratic concession would ensure both the KMTs victory and the maintenance of stability. So our theory then that we present, or our logic of explanation that we present in the article really comprises three parts. Strengths, signals, and <coughs> strategies. And I'm going to very briefly go into this. But I've given you lots of examples now. A little bit of Japan in 1947, a little bit of Indonesia in 1998, a little bit of South Korea in 1987, a little bit of KMT in 1986. How does this then inductively generate the theory that we're talking about? Well, the first part is, is that a regime is more likely to concede democracy when it enjoys antecedent strengths. When it has the basis, as I've described to you in the case of the KMT in Taiwan, the basis of stability, confidence, and victory. So these are not weak regimes. These are regimes that actually have built up a stock of political, economic, and social power that allows it the stability and victory confidence that is so important. We also are, so the second part is signals. We also argue that an authoritarian regime is more likely to concede democracy when it has just passed the apex of power. Right, so we have this curve here. A regime is most likely to concede democracy or most probably to concede democracy when it is no longer on the rise in terms of its political power, but that it's just past its apex of power. We call this the bittersweet spot. Right. It's bitter because you have to make a concession. It's sweet because if you make the concession in the bittersweet spot, 
probably going to win. Right? So we call it bittersweet. The key, though, is how do you know you've passed the agents? So what we then look at are signals. What does the regime see as signals that suggest to it that it has perhaps passed the apex of power? So the clearest signal would be electoral. In the case of Taiwan, we had limited elections. Opposition parties were not allowed to contest. But over time, the KMT could see that its popularity had begun to wane. Not a lot. It wasn't a curve like this. But it was gradually declining. It still held a supermajority. It still was the most powerful actor in politics, but it's beginning to wait. So electoral signals are a kind of signal that suggests the regime that has passed its apex of power. Other kinds of signals would include, for instance, public protest, geopolitical signals. So for instance, in the case of Taiwan, when the United States normalizes relations with the People's Republic of China, the KMT regime is essentially left to drift. And it no longer has its original raison d'etre to be ruling on the part or on the island, right? So a geopolitical shock. One can make the argument in Korea too. Right? The United States essentially starting to criticize uh, the Taiwan regime. The United States essentially turning its back in many ways on democratic activists. The looming specter that would be the 1988 Seoul Olympics, all of these geopolitical factors are also kinds of signals that may suggest to a regime that is passing the index of power. And of course, economic crisis. Economic crisis is a kind of signal we would suggest it's more of an indirect signal because regimes are able to oftentimes pass the blame. The point here is that there is some signal that suggests to the regime that it's passing the index of power that when it has just passed the apex of power, it's most likely to concede democracy, and it's most likely to concede to thrive and to survive. That said, there is also the case in which the regime may hurdle through the bittersweet zone. It may not make any concessions, and the point we make here is that once it passes this bittersweet spot, Gettys is right. You have no choice but to continue the pressure. So if you are a rational, uh, strategic actor, you pass the bittersweet spot, this is the best time to concede. If you make it down to here, well, you know, your best option actually is to repress and hang on to the very end. We argue, for instance, that Malaysia is here. Right? Indonesia is about there, Korea is about there, Taiwan is there. So the curve um, uh, matters. We also argue in the third part, so the second, first is strengths, signals, and then strategies. When you have antecedent strengths, but you begin to receive um, signals that you pass the apex of power, that then is tantamount to the need for re-legitimation strategies, and we would expect, therefore, then conflict, an intra-party struggle. So we may, for instance, argue that in 1989, we see this in China, conflict between folks on the Zhaoziang side versus the Lihang side. We see conflict. We don't predict which side is going to win. We're not in the game of prediction. But we are in the game of expectation of conflict and trying then to understand the politics of that, conflict, uh, of that conflict. One choice, of course, is to hang on. The other choice is to make it. <coughs> now, we can't get inside the heads of dictators, but we can see the outcomes of these struggles. We know what happens as a result of these struggles. And in some cases, we see concessions. Decisive reforms like free and fair elections, the formation of electoral commission, media reform. In other words, the ushering in of the possibility of defeat. Hence, if you're following the argument that we're making here, we have a paradox. When a ruling party enjoys substantial capacity, that is to say power, this not only increases its ability to sustain authoritarian rule, but can in fact lessen its imperative to do so. So this is the paradox, right? That when parties or dictatorships are strong, it actually has the power to remain authoritarian, but it may also have or present the incentive to choose democracy. And what we see, in fact, in the argument that we want to make in the case of Asia is that more often than not, the democracies that have emerged in Asia have chosen democracy at a time when they were still relatively strong. 
Now, this argument seems counterintuitive. This argument, when we wrote this in 2012 and published in 2013, it seemed counterintuitive. It seemed paradoxical, and we refer to it as paradoxical. But since then, we've really thought more clearly about it, and we've actually had some of our RAs look into this, and we've begun to look at this kind of, these sets of assertions more globally and worldwide, and we find that maybe it's not that counterintuitive that this kind of logic that we're arguing isn't that counterintuitive. So for instance, in 1986, and I, I can't give you the details on, on how this was coded because um, one of our RAs in Chicago did this, but anyway, I think it's, it's, it's demonstrative. In 1986, there were 83 authoritarian ruling parties. Since that time, 35 of those 86 have remained authoritarian. 48 have undergone political transitions. Of those 48, 15 are obsolete. In other words, they hurtle through. 15 remain competitive, but minor parties or coalition partners. And 18 have not only remained competitive, but have also remained the major dominant party. When you think about it that way, then, one might conclude it may, in fact, be quote-unquote incentive compatible for authoritarian regimes to concede from a position of strength. It may not be that paradoxical or counterintuitive as we may have initially thought. If it may be incentive compatible for authoritarian regimes to concede, if it may be incentive compatible, then we're talking about, it goes back to the very first slide, choice. It's about incentive compatibility, we're talking about choice. And where there is choice, and it goes back to the original argument, where there is choice, there is possibility. This then re brings us back and allows us to return to the question of China. Right? And now this book that we're writing is not a book about China. We told our editors at Princeton we're only writing one chapter on China, but it's an important chapter. We get to go back to the case of China. We return to the question of China. In our view, in light of the explanation that we've just given, in our view, democratic possibilities are very real in China, according to our theory. In fact, according to our logic of explanation, now is the best time for the Chinese Communist Party to, to concede. And so in our book, we treat the CCP as a candidate case. It's the best time for the CCP to concede because, in our analysis, the CCP has just passed the apex of power. That there are massive, looming problems on the horizon. Structural inequality, right? banking reform, uh, industrial uh, state-owned enterprise reform, rural development, and so on. Levels of inequality that are becoming intolerable. Corruption, and so on. There are looming problems on the horizon that would suggest that the CCP has just passed its apex of power. That said, if the Chinese Communist Party were to concede democratic reforms today, it's inconceivable in our analysis that the CCP would not win. In other words, if the CCP were to concede democracy today, just as Jiang Jinghua does in 1986, the CCP would win, just as the KMT does in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And indeed, contrary to the fears that we hear in Beijing, if the CCP were to concede, China would not fall apart. In fact, one can make the argument that the CCP, by conceding democracy, may in fact pull the country closer together. So in short, therefore, our argument would suggest that this is the best time for the Chinese Communist Party to concede democracy, not only obviously for the country of China, but also for the strategic long-term interests of the Chinese Communist Party, to ensure its near-term thriving and to ensure its long-term survival. Now, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to present this paper many times in China. I have a lot of friends in China. We have off-the-record conversations all the time in China, and it's fantastic. And what I want to report to you are the kinds of reactions I get in this paper. Right? I mean, I'm essentially arguing you should concede democracy today. You can imagine the kind of reactions I would get, or you can imagine how anxious and nervous I can be sometimes as I came to this argument in China. So this is what I hear from people. Some people say, you know, Joe, this is a fantastic argument. You're absolutely right. You and Dan absolutely are right. History shows that, in fact, um, 
conceding the fraud is in, indeed uh, the logic that would make the most sense for the Chinese Communist Party. But here's a problem. And we talk to party officials, and the party officials say, yeah, we should concede democracy to thrive, but could we hold off for five more years until my son graduates from Harvard? Now, this is very real, right? Concession, right, even though we say conceding to thrive is, is, a, is a kind of strategy that suggests that in all probability you will win, you still are ushering in a little bit of uncertainty, right? And so from an individual's point of view, they have their near-term interests versus the long-term interests of the party. And sometimes these interests are not aligned. We also hear, for instance, that for many people, that the Chinese Communist Party has not reached the apex of power. Right? That yes, when the CCP does just pass its apex of power, this argument makes a lot of sense, but the CCP has not reached the apex of power yet. And that's an argument that I think is quite defensible. What becomes very problematic is that when people say, an equal number of people say, the party has not reached its apex of power, you hear an equal number of people saying the party is already hurtled through. Right? That the party is so thoroughly delegitimated that if it were to concede democratic reforms today, it would topple. The CCP would lose. For us, what is most problematic is that we don't actually know where the CCP is on the Or at least those in China who follow this and those who would be our informants and respondents don't know where the CCP is on the curve precisely because the signals are entirely mixed. So those are the kinds of reactions that we hear in China. Let me say then in closing, um, let me say in closing that our theory is not intended to be predictive. At best, our theory predicts struggle. Right? So when you have signals and you have strength, we would predict that there is struggle. But we can't predict the outcome of this struggle. But that's about as best as we can do. In fact, I wouldn't even call this a theory. I call this really a logical explanation. Right? It's a logic that authoritarian regimes may follow. But it is a logic of explanation that is theoretically coherent. Right? There aren't that many moving parts to this. It's a theoretically coherent logic of explanation that helps explain, but not predict, everything that happens from Taiwan to what's happening in Burma today. So it's because of this logic, then, that I see very clearly China's democratic possibility. It's not a foregone conclusion, but China's democratic possibility. Because, as we argue, democracy need not unfold amidst crisis. Right? So Getty's theoretical axiom is not necessarily always right. That democracy need not emerge because of extreme dissatisfaction. But rather, democracy can emerge in China's democratic possibilities precisely because the Chinese Communist Party, like Chen Jinghua, sees the logic of such possibility. Sees that by conceding democracy, it may in fact benefit the party. So let me say, in closing, closing, I'm far too cynical that people will choose democracy because it is right. I want to stress very clearly that CCK was no Democrat. No Te Wu was not a nice person. Right. Habibi was not a nice person. Right. The conservatives in Japan in 1947 were definitely not nice people, and they couldn't wait for the American occupation because they sought to reform the Constitution. These are not nice people. I'm far too cynical that people will choose democracy because it is right, but it's that same cynicism. It's that same cynicism which leads me to believe that autocrats, such as CCK in Taiwan, and indeed the Chinese Communist Party in China, will choose what makes strategic sense for them. Will choose democracy because, in fact, it's best for the party and, by extension, for their country. So let me leave it at that. And thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome your comments and criticism. Thank you. Yes. Well, I basically, I find this theory very interesting. Do you think that um, it does sort of link with what I used to think before? Um, however, the, don't you think that the authoritarian sort of you know, peacefully transformed democracies, for example, does have a danger 
bring in a simplified version of democracy, well, which means that democracy with less liberalism probably doesn't have that sort of thing. Because I think that in many Asian countries, you're looking at, um, even, well, for example, just in this country, for example, we do, you know, it transformed, it have made democratic transformation. But legally, it, has, it still does have authoritarian structures and all that, and that's been overused by the, you know, the regimes that does have different fa you know, flavors about the, um, or different thoughts on democracy, and etc. And the same thing with Japan as well. Um, doesn't it sort of bar the authoritarian regime peacefully transforming democratic, um, democratic and democratization? Um, has got the possibility actually sort of doing meet the levels of it? Yep. 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 Absolutely. You know, one, one reading of this argument, and it's not wrong, is that in many ways this is like what we're writing is the handbook for dictators. Right? I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of like what we're writing here is if you want to save your own skin, you should read this book. Because this, this is the dictator's way out of their conundrum. Which is one reading of it. And indeed, some dictators in the world have invited us to come meet with them because they're interested to see how other dictators have managed their own expectations from authoritarian regimes. And we meet, you know, morally, we're like, no, this is a little problematic, but we go meet with them because we want to see how dictators think for precisely the reasons that you raised. What makes what was a dictator one night into a Democrat than it is? Or what makes an authoritarian regime one day and a quote unquote democratic regime the next? I mean, and that's a, that's a real serious question, right? So if you think about it, one of the arguments that we make for why this KMT enjoys tremendous victory confidence is because it's an electoral system that unfairly advantages it. So that's why I want to stress, CCK was not a nice person. CCK only concedes democracy. He concedes democracy, but he has no intention of losing. And he has, he has rigged the rules to ensure that he will not lose. And indeed, if CCK had lived past uh, 1988, or he would never have expected the KMT to lose. But indeed, the presidency does go to the opposition in uh, 1996, or 2000. Right? So, under its attribute. Right, so there, by ushering in a new set of rules, by ushering in the possibility of defeat, you then unleash a new process of political reform. So absolutely, you know, I take very seriously the sunflower movement in Taiwan because it raises questions of the quality of democracy. I take very seriously the various vigil movements that happen in South Korea because it raises the question of democracy, right, and the quality of democracy. But there's no denying, right, you can go anywhere, there's no denying that the extension of political rights and the exercise of political rights in Taiwan today is fundamentally different than it was in 1986. So this isn't an overnight transformation, and I think in many ways we would be naive to think that it was. There are always going to be these authoritarian legacies that have to be ironed out and indeed extricated over time. So if you were to apply our theory to, for instance, or our logic or explanation, for instance, to Chile, and I've chatted with lots of Latin Americans about this, so I wanted to sort of check to see if this argument made sense there. You know, Pinochet announces the plebiscite in 1980. The plebiscite is supposed to take place in 1988. To which he says, if I lose the plebiscite, I will step down. In 1980, if you would ask Pinochet, are you going to step down? Like, you know, do you expect to win this plebiscite? His answer would be, of course. There's no way I'm going. And this, in the Latin Americans will tell you, Pinochet in 1980, when he makes that institutional concession, has no, has no, you know, notion that he's going to lose. But by around 1986, 87, he sees that he might lose the plebiscite, and he builds in, of course, those famous authoritarian enclaves that allows him to have some say, and at least the ruling party some say, uh, in the governance of Chile, particularly over the military. So even when Consultacion comes in, you know. Uh, we don't see the highest quality of democracy. But there's no denying that democracy in Chile today is much more robust than it was in 1992, and it certainly is a political regime that's much more humane than it was in 1973. So your question is absolutely right. We're not in this book trying to explain the evolution of democracy over time. What we were trying to explain is why would an authoritarian regime make the concession that it would make at a particular moment in time, and then unleash a whole set of processes that are still playing out in Korea today. So for me, you know, one of the issues that I'm really interested in is, and one of the reasons why I came on this trip, 
and we'll be talking to some other people over the next few days is, you know, what was No Te Wu really? What was, did Chen Duan know that No Te Wu was going to make this decision? Did Chen Duan, Chen Duan sanction this? Um, what kinds of protections did they build into these kinds of improvements and so on, right? What kinds of enclaves and authoritarian enclaves would be built in the system to ensure that, uh, although it doesn't happen because Kim Jong Sen then you know, launches an investigation of both China and no, but you know, what is going to help them survive over the longer term? These are the kinds of things that are interesting. But in our mind, there's no denying that in 1987, Note basically says, look, we could either hang on, right, or we can concede now it's a gamble. But as it turns out, it wasn't a bad gamble. Right? The opposition splits, and the new movement splits, and he wins the presidency. Other questions? Uh, yes? Thank you for your special lecture. And I heard some researchers use the term uh, conservative authoritarianism. Yeah. And they argued that uh, some, some, some authoritarian regime, for example, the CCP, and the countries in the Central Asian area uh, have their authority and get more powerful legitimacy for uh, using the democratic institution for the election. And they also argue that maybe authoritarianism will be developed more the other way. So what do you think of this argument? About consultative authoritarianism? Um, I don't buy it. I mean, I, you know, what um, the, big, the big conversation in China right now is on um, deliberative politics. Um, and so the argument that the CCP makes is that it's engaging in a kind of deliberative, consultative um, authoritarianism. So the argument there is that, well, we're listening to the people. Um, there's no denying that authoritarian regimes listen to the people. I mean, I don't, authoritarian regimes don't typically survive if they ignore the people, right? Um, they may not respect all the wishes of the people. They may respect only, particularly in patronage regimes, only a small section of the people. But authoritarian regimes, by their nature, have to be consultative and listening to people. The problem is, is that when you have the argument that this is deliberation, right? Um, the key, I mean, if you look at liberal theory or political theory, the key to deliberation is that the outcome of deliberation should be uncertain. That is to say, you don't know them. And, but at the same time, the consequences of those doing the, the deliberating should be certain. That is to say, protected by law. You don't have that in China. Right. So you can call it deliberative, but you don't have the institutions that guarantee the certainty of being a deliberator and that you're not going to go to jail. And oftentimes, we've seen the outcomes of these deliberations are foregone. So, you know, I, I don't buy that, you know, again, authoritarian regimes are not, um, these are not Machiavellian, disconnected uh, regimes. Authoritarian regimes are oftentimes consultative, but they're far from Uh, uh, two, two points. One I think is very positive, the other one is more critical. So I'll start with the one, bittersweet, that's your approach. Um, so the first, I, I don't know if you mentioned that in the book, but how your theory is in relation with like prospect theory? Uh, so Kahneman and, and, and so forth. So like, I mean, my, my sort of prospect theory read of what you're saying would be that when you see that you could potentially enter in the domain of loss and suddenly lose that, you just uh, change your behavior. If you really feel strongly that you are in domain of wit, so you feel that your apex is not there, whatever you can read that, then you go that. So, so in a sense, it will not be a parable anymore. But you could interpret that as a, you know, uh, being scared, being scared about entering the domain of loss, and it's like risk aversion of yep. whatever. Like it's, it's the level of risk aversion of the dictator you're analyzing, or the parties in power, or the ruling elite, whatever. This. So for example, I don't know, in the case of China, one might argue that these people are uh, maybe uh, either conceiving, as you're saying, that they're not entering the domain of law, so they might not be that risk averse, or they might be, and in this case, they will take a decision. And the second is more as a, as a sociologist, and it's a more critical one. It's like if we look at different societies, that there are other factors that interact there and, and might make this story more complicated. And I know that your aim is to try to find a neat, parsimonious explanation of this stuff.
but there is a lot that might interact. So the ideology of, of, of these people might be a variable there, and the other one might be society, which, you know, in a sense, you give a vision from, so from the top, how these people decided. It might work very well in Asian countries. I can see how it works for Taiwan. I, I, I really see how it does work. But then if you try to apply that, for example, to Latin American societies, then you know, their movements and society are probably more dynamic yeah. or uh, have different spins. So how would you relate to that? And, and, and if you think that you can try to accommodate some of this, uh, these points into the, into the overall story. So I would, I would answer both the questions in the same way as say that what we're trying, in, in terms of the elegance of the, of the explanation, we're, what we're trying to do is highlight uh, a very parsimonious, elegant mechanism, right, that would, um, it's not predictive. So we're not saying that, you know, under these conditions, X, Y, and Z, you will, with, uh, you know, whatever probability, pick X over Y, but rather it presents to the decision maker a choice set. So if we're looking, for instance, in terms of prospect theory or the work of you know, Kahneman and people like that, absolutely, right? How you think about uncertainty, what heuristic cues you may use, these are all going to influence that struggle part. So that's why I say we would predict struggle. We would expect struggle, but we don't predict the outcome of the struggle precisely for the reasons that you said, because there are some that would be more or less adverse. There are obviously those who would lose or gain more. There are near-term interests versus long-term interests. But we can document that, right? So that's essentially in the in the book, which we're still writing, so it's not out yet. I mean, in the book, what we're doing is we're trying to describe those processes, right? Um, and try to analytically build in then all of the layers of complexity that you're uh, that you're rightly indicating. But in the end, all of these cases are presenting to the authoritarian regime an elegant decision, right? And want to or an elegant explanation for. Decision that they eventually have to make. So you're absolutely right. So all these layers of complexity in terms of societal structure, in terms of ideology, all of these shape these stories. But it also allows us then to make the explanation as to why we see Japan making, or the LDP making the decisions that it makes between 47 and 55, just as we can try to begin to understand why the military makes its decisions that it does, or the PSPD, or the USDP in Burma. Right. So, the story of Burma in 2011 is not the story of Japan in 1947, but the decision that they're faced with is not the same. And so the book is essentially in each chapter, or in each case, we want to present that decision, but that decision then, of course, is cloaked and it's, it's, it's built up around uh, the deep analysis of each case. But we're convinced that that choice is the same across all these cases. The ultimate decision is going to depend on the specific case themselves. So, with respect to China, you know, part of this is, you know, you, you can you can probably see, you know, what we're trying to do here is the reason why we're writing the Japan chapter is because I'm tired of hearing the arguments from China that democracy was just simply imposed in Japan and that the Japanese themselves did nothing for their democracy. Incidentally, the Chinese will make the same argument about democracy in Korea, right? which is, I think, to those who fought for democracy in Korea. But don't make the argument that because Korea was part of the American Imperium, democracy was just simply gifted from the West uh, here. We want to make the argument that that's just a crap, right? That by looking at Japan 47, that's just a stupid, unsustainable argument. Um, at the same time, we also want to make the argument with respect to China that these are, it's a decision that the CCP will have to make. And it's a decision that the CPSU made in the Soviet Union. It's a decision right, that the National Party in South Africa has to make. It's a decision that the KMT, that it never thought it would have to make, it has to make in 1986. Just to forewarn the CCP that such a decision made. So, you know, it's, it, the book is really quite a normatively loaded uh, tract. Other questions?